Hello, and welcome to our next lecture as we continue talking about the uh, cognitive neuroscience of memory. So in the previous lectures, I introduced a little history, uh, talked about some of the neurobiology underlying memory, and then talked about uh, memory disorders. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to introduce uh, some shorter term memory systems and then direct you to a couple of existing lectures on predictive power of working memory capacity and neurobiology of working memory. Um, which will kind of finish up this area on shorter term memory systems. I wanted to give you a shorter, uh, briefer version and more neuroscience based uh, look at the shorter term and working memory and executive functioning systems that I talk about in more detail in those other lectures rather than making you suffer through uh, the extensive lectures from my cognitive course. Um, but I want to give you a quick overview of memory systems, and I'm going to talk about short-term memory, and then we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about working memory and executive functions. So as we started talking um, in the previous lecture about different memory systems, this is a pretty big taxonomy of all the memory systems uh, we'll eventually talk about. So I'll introduce some of the neurobiology of declarative memory um, over here on the left. So if you see at the bottom, talked about medial temporal lobes, middle diencephalon, and uh, neocortex as being important parts of that um, uh, extensive system. And so I kind of introduced a lot of that uh, neurobiology. Now, if we go over here to non-declarative memory, uh, in the motor learning lectures, we talked about basal ganglia, cerebellum, and a variety of these pathways. Uh, today, we're up here in the upper right-hand corner in sensory short-term and working memory. And... Um, it's less of a memory system and more of an attention and sort of command and control system for all of our memories, um, particularly our conscious memories. So we're going to think a lot about uh, how this intersects with a bunch of different systems as we go along, but I wanted to kind of get you an idea as to where we were at. So I want to dive into some shorter term forms of memory. Uh, we'll start with sensory memory. Uh, sensory memory is one of those things I kind of talks a little about here and there because it really functionally doesn't I mean it does have functions don't get me wrong uh, but it's not something we intersect with a great deal um, other than that we need to know that it works particularly if you're somebody who's designing um, cognitive experiments you need to understand how iconic memory works um, because it requires some specific experimental strategies um, but iconic memory is essentially a very brief raw copy of your visual memory and so uh, this comes up in experiments because if you uh, present, say, a word on the screen for 50 milliseconds, um, that word will still be available in iconic memory for a brief period of time. And so we use what's called the backward pattern mask. Um, that is, the word will be presented and then X's or something else will come up on the screen uh, to essentially override it in uh, visual memory. This was traditionally thought of as a pre-attentive process. George Sperling did some really brilliant studies uh, regarding this in the 1960s. We're starting to view this, though, based on fMRI and other studies um, that show that this actually might be tied directly to visual attention. And so if we look at uh, some of the fMRI data, and we'll look at this here in a minute with uh, working memory as well, <clears throat> a lot of this really ties directly in with those visual attention areas we talked about previously. That gets us to echoic memory. Echoic memory is a very brief holdover for uh, sounds and sound-based uh, information. Uh, I want to introduce what's called the mismatch negativity and then just briefly talk about how echoic memory is critical for things like uh, American Sign Language translation. So echoic memory um, is, again, um, very brief sensory um, memory for sounds. And what's interesting, and the reason... I think it's interesting to talk about mismatch negativity and it sort of gives us an idea as to where this uh, echoic memory processing is occurring. So uh, the mismatch negativity effect is an event-related potential effect that is related to what we call the oddball task. And an oddball task is basically you're paying attention to something and it's always the same and then all of a sudden it's not. It's an oddball. So if you were looking at a screen, say it might be a round circle and then a red square would pop up and then you go back to the brown circle, the brown the blue circles and then suddenly you get a red square, a bunch of blue circles and a red square. And we get this oddball effect um, in visual processing as well. But for this mismatch negativity, it's basically you get the same tone over and over again and then you get a different tone. 
What makes this interesting is that we can direct this change in event-related potentials and particularly in fMRI studies uh, to the auditory cortex. So this is happening where auditory information is being processed uh, primarily. And so this is a very early um, holdover of information uh, until we can <clears throat> deal with it. Now it has some important applications. So for example, um, if you are trying to translate uh, American Sign Language, um, so if you're a translator listening to a speaker and translating it into sign language, um, you have to hold on to the auditory information long enough to get it translated. And so what this requires is essentially a shorter term, a short, very short term memory system that holds on to that information long enough for you to translate it and then it can sort of, you know, go on its way. Obviously you can't hold on to it because <clears throat> there's new information coming in as you're translating. And um, one of the things you uh, hear from all kinds of translators, foreign language translators, is they oftentimes don't remember what they translated because it's just they're not paying any attention to it. All they're doing is translating into a second language. <clears throat> and that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Excuse me. Um, so there's some other interesting stuff with uh, American Sign Language translation. So if you're interested in it, there's a lot of interesting work you can look at uh, where they look at the... Um, working memory associated with the gestures themselves. So as you're looking at somebody who's gesturing and you're translating uh, the signs into language um, and uh, the other direction, whereas you're turning sounds into gestures. There's really interesting work done in that area. So working memory is a really important component uh, of that. That gets us into talking about shorter term and short term memory. So one of the things that gets that's sort of frustrating about teaching a cognition course is trying to get people to understand um, what short-term memory is. And from a cognitive perspective, it's the last 30 seconds. Anything more than that um, is uh, now into episodic memory, or long-term memory. We'll talk here in a moment about working memory. And working memory is an important component uh, for us to think about uh, because a lot of what we thought of as short-term memory, we really view as view as um, using your working memory, in particular things like the phonological loop. Um, so there's a lot of work that's been done in this area. Uh, George Miller in his classic work um, in short-term memory capacity um, really got us started as part of the founding of cognitive psychology. But we tend to view short-term memory uh, from a science per perspective as a specific kind of working memory task. Um, so we refer to this as passive short-term memory tasks. Uh, not really as a memory system, but a short-term memory task that taps into a specific part of working memory. So digit span, which is one of George Miller's classic um, tasks that he used to discover the you know working memory capacity of seven digits right around there, uh, is related to uh, the capacity of what we call the phonological loop. And so we think about that, that as a passive short-term memory task and not an active memory task. So digit span backwards, we call that an active memory task, where rather than um, simply getting a series of digits and repeating them back to the experimenter, um, you get a series of digits, and then your task is to reverse the order of those. So you have to actually work with um, that kind of task. We call, I call it an active memory task. And that's a kind of working memory task. So an important historical note <clears throat> um, about short-term memory and kind of why it crops up a lot uh, has to do with what's called the modal model, the atkinson schiffer model. And as we start thinking about how memory works and how memory is formed, this is an important thing to think about. So this is one version of many that you may have seen. This uh, comes up in a lot of different areas. Basically, here's the idea. We have sensory information that comes in. It goes to that sensory register or that sensory memory, iconic memory, echoic memory. Um, attention, then, is the task by which we f focus on something from that sensory register, and then we move it to short-term storage. Um, and then uh, from short-term memory, we can then use an auditory rehearsal process or visual rehearsal process and move that into long-term storage. Um, this is a classic model. It's almost entirely wrong. Um, Rich Schifrin is a terrific scientist, uh, and this was done in 1971. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with the science behind this. It's just 
it's not how we know memory works now. So a couple of things. Um, we really think, and we'll talk about this in a moment, that the central executive and central attention are probably the same process. And there are short-term storage processes in working memory, so the visual spatial sketch pad and the phonological loop where information is held on to. Um, but that attention mechanism, that rehearsal mechanism, are both part of working memory. We also know that rehearsal is not how information gets into long-term storage. In fact, rehearsal is one of the worst ways in which you can try to get something into long-term memory. And so that's why this is an historical note. Um, there are a couple of things we need to think about in terms of so there are a lot of people who get into this question of whether or not working memory or short-term memory, long-term memory, is there really a distinction? Uh, there clearly is. We have two patients uh, that will come up in a variety of discussions. Uh, patient KF. Uh, KF had um, a, a brain injury and had very limited um, short-term memory capacity, uh, but perfectly fine long-term memory. So short-term memory is not necessary for long-term memory encoding, so we sort of have difficulty with the... Um, Modal model already. And then, of course, patient HM, we've already discussed, um, had uh, fine working and short term memory, but no long term memory. So, this provides what we call a double dissociation of the sort of underlying neurobiology of short term memory and long term memory. We have distinct memory systems uh, that don't fit in with the uh, modal model. So that gets us then to working memory. And working memory, this is a, a model that was uh, really established by Badalay, Alan Badalay. It has three major components that we talk about. The phonological loop, the visual spatial sketch pad, and the central executive. Um, if you're interested in lots of detail on these, I refer you to some of my online lectures on, uh, I have a lecture on the phonological loop and a lecture on the visual spatial sketch pad. Um, for cognitive neuroscience, basically, here's the um, deal with the phonological loop. This is where verbal auditory information is held on to. So when you're saying something over and over to yourself, this is what we used to do when we tried to remember somebody's phone number because um, we used to have to do that. And just say it over and over to yourself, um, trying to keep that into you, sort of trying to keep it active. And so it's essentially a loop that involves the language centers, and those language centers we'll be talking about very shortly. Uh, and so this is generally left hemisphere, which is where most of our language tends to be, um, involving Broadman's area 44. You can see right there at the frontal um, temporal junction, and then uh, also there at the temporal parietal junction. And so this is really our language centers that are involved in the phonological loop. Visual spatial sketch pad is where we work with uh, visual and spatial information. So uh, one of the tasks that we use a lot in um, visual spatial sketch pad is something like mental rotation, where you mentally rotate an object to a different view, um, that sort of thing. Uh, sometimes we do um, visual spatial working memory tasks, so a spatial span task. Um, the course I block tapping task is a classic example of that. And what we see is, uh, this tends to be more right hemisphere. So we get lateralization of the phonological loop in the visual spatial sketch pad. One of the things you can see in that superior view is the, um, in the right lateral view, sorry, is some of the areas that we're seeing activated in spatial memory tasks are also the same areas that are activated uh, with uh, visual spatial attention. So these two, the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad, are where information is held onto or stored. So information is stored in the phonological loop, so visual, verbal or auditory information is held onto in the phonological loop. Visual and spatial information is held onto in the visual spatial sketch pad, and then the central executive is sort of in charge of the whole thing. Um, and so the central executive is involved in planning and coordination um, and working with uh, problem solving, et cetera. Central executive functions are particularly important as we start thinking about um, a variety of different tasks uh, and attention and consciousness, et cetera. So that gets us to working memory and executive functions. Uh, as I said, this plays a major role in attention, planning, and coordination of information. Uh, it's responsible for suppressing irrelevant information, and this becomes really important as we start thinking about 
how aging affects cognitive functions, how head injuries can affect cognitive functions. Because one of the things we have to do is we have to focus on one thing and ignore other things. And the central executive does quite a bit of that. Uh, so let's get to some of the characteristics of that central executive. Big part of this is planning and coordination, but not storage of information. And this is where we start thinking about how we coordinate information and also do things like plan for the future. So as we start getting into some of these social cognitive um, tasks and goal-directed tasks uh, in um, the next couple of chapters in the course, we're going to talk a lot about central executive. So this is something that's going to come up quite a bit. One of the things we can see, for example, is there are certain drugs that um, really limit our ability to plan for the future. Um, and so one of the things we often use in this kind of test of the central executive is called the Iowa gambling task. People get very bad at that when they're under the influence of a drug like cocaine. Uh, they also um, take uh, more risks, more sexual risks, that sort of thing. So planning and coordination occurs in the central executive. Storage of information, that is information that's held in those subsystems, phonological loop, and the visual spatial sketch pad. Okay. So next I want to get into illustrating what the executive does by talking about its functions. So let's start with Wisconsin card sorting. Um, this is a classic neuropsych test. Not a lot of people use it anymore. I like talking about it because it really illustrates the concept of uh, hypothesis testing and trying to use previous information to, um, to uh, do goal-motivated uh, behaviors. So um, here's the sort of setup. Um, the top row of cards, these would be sort of the what we call exemplar cards. Um, and you can see there are a variety of different components. Uh, first is there are four different shapes. Next, there are four different colors. And then there are also different numbers of items on the card. So one, two, three, or four. So now the card on the bottom, the task of the person who uh, is being given this test, uh, their task would be to sort that card onto the correct pile. Uh, the question is, what pile does it go on to? Well, um, the person giving the test will have uh, selected, and there's a standardized way to do this, um, a, uh, an attribute of the card for which they would sort it. So what the person has to do is they have to hypothesis test. So if they put it um, there on card number two, they would be sorting based on number. If they put it on card number three, they would be sorting based on shape, and then card number four based on color. And all the examiner does is say yes or no. So if they put it on card number two, let's say, well, that means it's not number. And so we'll go to the next two, um, shape or color. So essentially what you have to use is you have to use that feedback to plan future behavior and then you know keep hypothesis testing. What we see with um, people, particularly oftentimes with head injuries, is as they've lost that central executive functioning, they can no longer sort of plan and coordinate. And so they make what we call perseverative errors. So what will happen in this uh, test is uh, the person will sort based on an attribute. And once they've figured it out, they'll keep sorting based on that attribute. And then unbeknownst to them, the examiner will switch the attribute. Uh, and when that happens, individuals who have difficulty with central executive functioning, they cannot switch to a new attribute. They can't figure out that they need to switch, and so they'll perseverate. They'll keep trying the same thing over and over again. Um, and that's a problem. So uh, I think that Wisconsin court sort card sorting task, the reason I like to talk about it is it really illustrates this using previous information to um, use uh, motivated goal behavior. Then we get to talking about some other tasks. So an end back task. This is used in fMRI studies quite a bit. Essentially what the end back task does is you have to um, keep information in mind while you're working through a task. So you might be getting a series of digits. And your task would be to figure out if uh, the current digit is greater or less than one, two digits ago, or you'll have to add them together, or to figure out if three odd numbers have appeared in a row. There are a number of things where you have to go back one or two um, stimuli to try to figure out uh, the task. And then backward span tasks, where you have to do, you get a series of digits, and then you have to reverse their order, would also be an executive task. Um, I talk in uh, the next lecture that I'll direct you to about what are called um, operation span tasks, um, or they're usually storage plus 
uh, manipulation tasks. Uh, and those are actually quite difficult, but they also really get at the capacity of executive functioning. So um, that gets us to this executive attention model of working memory capacity. So one of the things we get really interested in is how much information can people hold in their working memory capacity. And in the next lecture, um, there's a lot about that in terms of how this works and why that's an important thing to do. Um, what uh, Randy Engel and uh, his colleagues have um, come up with is this two-factor theory of executive control. That is the maintenance of task goals and active memory. Um, working memory capacity is associated with the ability to stay on task. And so maintenance of what it is you're supposed to be doing is an important part of working memory capacity. One of the things that many of us are finding uh, during this sort of high-stress quarantine COVID-19 problem is staying on task. Well, that's because, as we'll talk uh, a couple lectures uh, from this one, uh, under stress, uh, cortisol really zaps our ability to function, particularly in terms of our working memory capacity. It reduces it dramatically. Uh, the other uh, factor involved in executive control is resolution of response competition or conflict. Um, and so um, when we start getting into things like the go-no-go no go task, um, and then we have uh, conflict or competition between responses, um, that resolution is an important part of executive control. This is particularly important for what we call prepotent or habitual behaviors uh, when those conflict with the behaviors appropriate to the current goal. And so this is one of those things where you sort of have a learned habit and you have to try to unlearn it. This requires a lot of executive control to do. Um, so a couple of these we see are uh, things like the Stroop task uh, with rare incongruent trials. So let me take you through the Stroop test. The Stroop task is one in which uh, you'll have a stimulus like this and the task is to read the color of the ink quote unquote, uh, a color of the letters themselves um, and not the word. So here we have a congruent trial, another congruent trial, another congruent trial, another congruent trial, another. Now we get to an incongruent trial where you have to ignore the word and focus on the color of the letters themselves. So the appropriate response here would be red as it would have been here. Blue would have been the response here. But now the response is red, even though the word is green. So this is an incongruent trial. So ignoring that prepotent response, that word, uh, is very difficult to do and requires a great deal of exec executive control. Uh, what's interesting is this uh, can come up in a variety of really important real-world situations. Um, and in particular is one that I've had some experience with myself, which is their Mercedes-Benz uh, in their CLA, GLA models um, had moved the way that you shift their vehicles into drive, in and out of drive, into reverse um, to the column. So, um, and the reason this is a problem is for most of us, That particular lever, so on the left is the Mercedes-Benz, on the right is the Toyota Camry, the most popular car in America. And the Toyota Camry, when you pop that little lever up, it activates the windshield wipers once or twice. So as you're driving along and it starts to mist, you'll just reach over and pop that up and uh, clear the windshield. In the Mercedes-Benz, that throws the car into neutral. So uh, you pop it up to go into neutral and then into park or down. I think down is into reverse. I can't remember. Um, anyway, the problem is, is if you are stepping on the gas to pull out into traffic and then hit the windshield wipers to clear the mist, if you're in the Mercedes, what you will have done is thrown your car into neutral. And the reason I know this is that I've done it a number of times. Um, I don't own one of these cars, but I used to drive them quite a bit when I lived in Washington, D.C., and we'll get to that here in a moment. Um, similarly, we have the um, Mercedes and the Honda Accord. Every car I've ever driven except for the Mercedes. It's the windshield wiper over there on the right. So as you can see here, um, uh, we can go up from drive to neutral, up again to reverse. We push the little button in for park. 
Um, so here's why the design is bad. So we have a prepotent or habitual behavior that conflicts with behaviors appropriate to the current goal. So the current goal is to get the windshield wipers on. And uh, what we've done is we've thrown the car into neutral. Uh, so new cars new to this, uh, drivers new to this car have to inhibit that automatic response. Much of what we do when we drive is automatic. That's how people become good drivers is they don't have to concentrate on things like turning on the windshield wipers. These particular cars were used by Car2Go, which was a business based on relative rare usage of cars. So this is how I got this experience. When I lived in DC, I didn't have a car and I would use Car2Go, uh, hop in one, uh, run an errand uh, or go somewhere. Great thing about Car2Go is you can just leave the car wherever you wanted to. Um, and so uh, what you end up with are people who are not driving this car very often, getting into it, and then throwing the car into neutral at the wrong time. Probably why Car2Go doesn't exist anymore. So uh, that's a quick introduction to how this works. Now, uh, the neurobiology of executive functioning is primarily in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex of uh, the brain. And that's where we get, I get into that in the neurobiology of working in memory, in particular why traumatic brain injury, stress, and other uh, issues are really complicated when it comes to um, the underlying biology of working memory. I also, um, encourage you to look at the predictive power of working memory capacity because it's tied in with intellectual functioning, fluid intelligence, and all sorts of other things, ability to learn languages, uh, et cetera. Uh, anyway, that is our introduction to uh, shorter term forms of memory. We will be getting into um, longer term memories here uh, in a couple of lectures.